Hi, everyone. So uh, it's been a busy year for INQ, <laughs> uh, having just gone public here. Um, so I'm going to just walk through kind of um, trying to cut through a lot of the noise that we see in the quantum industry. Um, and also, I'm going to, at the end of it, announce a new quantum computer from INQ. So obviously, a great year for INQ. We went took the company public. Um, which allows us to invest some run roughly, probably $800 million into quantum, almost as much as the US government. And I would argue, too, that we're lifting kind of all boats, if you will. I notice lots of other companies have copied our pitch deck materials, and lots of other people sit down and say, well, if I and Q is worth $4 billion, then we must be worth you know, $10 billion. So um, I think in that sense, it's kind of helping everyone. And it's also driving a great deal of investment into quantum, probably more so than even the big companies are, because uh, INQ is a place where investors can actually invest. Now, as a public company, I have now these new, new parts to my slide, which says that I'm going to be talking about forward-looking statements. And I have now almost as large a legal team as I do in R&D. Um, if you'd like to read the entire thing, it's available in a press release that we released at the same time as my talk. So we're out here creating a whole new category. We're doing category creation, which is really exciting, because if you look at the companies that have come before us, those who create new categories are actually driving uh, the markets and driving a return for investors. So category creation is actually a very valuable uh, place to be. However, there's a couple of challenges with it. Um, you know, we've all heard about the hype cycle, so we don't want to do that. Um, and also just kind of managing expectations. And also, usually in category uh, creation, you have this problem of kind of linear thinking and incremental thinking. So before INQ, of course, I was at Amazon, by the way. Um, make sure you get your orders in by the 23rd so you can get your two-day shipping. Um, and then before that, I was with Ray Kurzweil. And of course, Ray was uh, well known for predicting the future. And so what he made the point is, is that technology builds on itself. It goes faster and faster. And you can see that. You can, if you plot out technology since the beginning of time, is it's now getting to the point where on a daily basis you get a email about some breakthrough. And that's just going to accelerate. But as humans, we experience time linearly. And so we have a really difficult time kind of predicting the future. And so if you look at kind of where those two things are, and by the way, quantum, you know, usually this problem is, is kind of ex, is exponential, but quantum is doubly exponential. So we have no experience with that. And I'll just give you an example of this. Um, if we ask people today, um, you know, how long before you break encryption? Most people then go back and refer to the probably last 10 years of investment in quantum and say, well, if we continued that kind of pace of investment into the future, then it would be 10 or 15 years. But what happens if you ask them a different question? What happens if you said, I gave you all the resources you ever needed then when could you break encryption? Probably that would be a different answer. And so this idea of that the, the future kind of is based largely on the past, when it comes to technology, doesn't turn out to actually work very well. So, um, and we get to this place in the middle here, which is this zone of impatience, which is this kind of area where, you know, at the beginning you need to kind of sell a vision, and then you actually need to start working on it, you need to have steady progress, and then, you know, if I was to come out tomorrow morning and say I have a vision of building a teleporter, then very quickly everyone wants one. And they can't wait for me to build it. And then I, it might take me five years to go build that teleporter, and they're all very, very impatient about that. So we have a little bit of like that in quantum as well. And so we need to do a good job of managing that. It's not the hype cycle. It's literally how do we manage those expectations. And then most businesses that when they're creating a new category, there's this idea of network effects. How do either individuals or companies come together 
to actually accelerate faster than you would uh, just individually. So um, this is kind of how we see the market kind of going forward. We expect it to accelerate quickly, coming up fairly shortly. So the first part is creating a vision. Um, and so there's been a number of other products that came before us, obviously. Um, first one, you know, and it's many, somebody had a vision, usually starts in science fiction. One of the reasons I like science fiction is somebody had back in the 60s an idea of this little communicating device that we saw in Star Trek. And I'm sure there was a bunch of people who said, oh, by the way, that will never work. There's atmospheric conditions and a whole bunch of other junk that says that that would never actually work. But within just, I don't know, five years, six years, um, the first cell phone actually happened. But it wouldn't have happened if, and in fact, actually, the inventor of the first cell phone said, I was inspired by Star Trek and the fact of that early communicator. So you have to vision it first, somebody has to dream it, and then you have to actually go build it. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and I'll give you another example of that. It's actually, actually related to uh, quantum. So I don't know if you remember back in 1990, well before um, kind of quantum was popular, there was a movie uh, and it, it highlighted SeaTac astronomy. And it was all about breaking encryption. And if you, if you took the anagram here, it was too many secrets. And it was this movie with Robert Redford, 1990. Turned out that one of the people that um, was the technical advisors was one of the three individuals that uh, came up with CSA, um, RSA, the A in RSA. So he was actually the technical advisor to this movie on to make sure that the math and everything else that was being shown was actually technically correct. So I'm gonna, this is a vision, this is like the Star Trek one, this is a vision of breaking encryption using just a little chip. And I'm just gonna play just a few seconds of this. Holy cow, what the hell is this? There's a war out there, old friend, a world war. Oh my gosh. How is this possible? It's not about who's got the most bullets, it's about who controls the information. Anybody want to shut down the Federal Reserve? Hey, don't wait, screw wait, around wait, with that wait, thing. Wait. It's all about the information. So it's a code breaker. No, it's the code breaker. So 1990, somebody was thinking about building a little chip that could break encryption. Well before this kind of quantum stuff. Uh, it was, by the way, it was a room temperature device that's in the movie. It's a single chip uh, that could break encryption. And in the movie, it's actually stored inside the answering machine is where he keeps it. So it's a room temperature encrypt, uh, decryptor that uh, is in a single chip. And so, uh, and it's actually this box that they show in the movie, it's, which is hidden inside an answering machine. And so I don't know when um, people started working on quantum if they use this movie as their inspiration. Um, but we first need to start with a vision. And then the next piece is during this process is there's a bunch of people who will tell you that it won't work. Probably everyone from you know, your mother to your best friends to your colleagues and all the rest of it is extremely common. I've started five companies now. I think in every one of them, um, they've told me that it wouldn't work. Um, and so it just happens to be somehow part of human nature. There's always a group of people who want to go against the vision and tell you it can't be done. And in reality, of course, is it does. It happens. It works. And so this is obviously from, uh, from Nets, um, uh, Netflix, and they had the same problem. And so we're getting a little bit of that today in quantum. So we need to manage expectations carefully. So when we did it, we came out with a roadmap. We didn't use the, the, the kind of uh, quantum volume numbers because they sounded, they sounded better. We went to algorithmic qubits because we thought this really kind of describes the useful qubits that we expect to have in the system. We didn't, we didn't overhype it. Um, we thought this was reasonable progress given, given where we were and where we expected to go kind of into the future. Uh, and having algorithmic qubits, these numbers which are the you know, the, the, the numbers in white, 
give you a good indication of the number of useful qubits you'll be able to use for computation over time. So this is kind of our trying to set expectations with the marketplace. But I think the other side is that I need to educate the consumers. In Boston, uh, there was a, a bunch of advertising from um, Cy Sims here. He was a uh, retailer that sold men's suits. He had this little thing that said, um, an educated uh, consumer is my best customer. And I think for I and Q, that's exactly the case as well. So I, as part of it, not only do we need to make sure that we're um, uh, kind of not overhyping this thing and setting expectations correctly, but we need the consumer to be educated too. So to that, I'm actually gonna spend a few minutes just trying to, to kind of uh, help through that process. So we came up with this concept of algorithmic qubits, and I'll explain that in just a minute with a couple of visuals. Um, but to kind of understand algorithmic qubits, you have to understand good enough. And so I'm gonna use an analogy, which is actually uh, real numbers on a, a computer. You probably know that a real number, you know, is a, is a number just between zero and one has infinite values. It goes on forever. So obviously you cannot do a real number on a personal computer or a mainframe because it would require just for one number to store it properly, it would require infinite memory. So clearly I will make the bold prediction based on that, that computing cannot do math. It can't possibly do math because it can't possibly store real numbers. So if somebody came along and said, well, what if what we did is we truncated the precision so that it was good enough for most applications? It's not good enough for everything, but it's gonna be good enough for most applications. And that became uh, a bunch of IEEE standards for floating point. And so with 64 bits, you know, it specifies where where you can specify in a real number and where you can't. And it seems to work for most people. If you're using your laptop and you're not really having problems with math, it's probably working for you. But it won't work for everyone. I'm sure there's atomic physicists and others who need more precision or are frustrated as hell by their laptop. So we made a decision here that where do we going to truncate the precision for most applications? And I'll just make the point, here's Excel, so you can see this yourself. If you take uh, one over 9,000, this is the internal representation that you're seeing here. In Excel, it has 15 significant digits. If you add one to it, well then it needs to, it loses precision at the bottom end. And then if you then subtract one to it, you get a different number. So this simple math actually shows you where this doesn't work. But you've probably used Excel many, many times and thought to yourself, hey, this is working great. For most people, most people think Excel is a wonderful product. The reality, though, is that the floating point is only good enough for that particular application for most users. And that was a reasonable trade-off, rather than say, well, maybe my personal computer could only store 10 floating point numbers and make it a much higher uh, precision. So we need to do that same sort of trade-off in quantum. And so that's what I'm going to kind of talk about today. So what is good enough for quantum? Well, there's this relationship between the number of qubits and the fidelity. And so at some point, you can give more qubits than you have fidelity, and it no longer matters. There's diminishing returns after that. And as you increase the, uh, the fidelity, then you can use more qubits but there's this tight interrelationship between qubits and fidelity. And if you have a lot of fidelity and you have very few qubits, you can't get to anything interesting. And if you go the other way, if you have a lot of qubits but not a lot of fidelity, that doesn't matter either. The Goldilocks zone is something where both of those things uh, come together at the same time for an average application. That's key. So like Excel, you have to decide, well, what is that average application? And so the QEDC came through and defined some benchmarks, I'm not saying these are actually the average applications we wanna use in the future, but at least there are some applications. And they went through and said, okay, for these applications, what is the relationship between the number of qubits 
and the fidelity. And it compares all the various companies. Now at a high level, and I'm gonna help you work through this because this is, is unfortunately difficult stuff, um, is, is, you know, red is bad. That's pretty, that's pretty clear, they're usually kind of universal, right? So if you look, what that really means is the success probability is way below 50%, which really means it's noise. Okay, you're just not gonna get a reasonable, uh, reasonable answer. So the question is, 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 how do we draw an area here where there's a reasonable relationship between number of qubits and fidelity for these applications? Now I'll make the point, if you look here, there's several different applications, and the slope of the line, okay, is the relationship between the qubits and the fidelity. Most applications we've seen, you need the square of the qubits in terms of, of gates to be able to do that application. Well, you'll notice one here that's cubed. It's actually often a place where it needs a lot more gates to be able to run that application. Maybe that application is in, should be included in kind of average applications, I don't know. But so you have this relationship between qubits, fidelity, and the application you wanna run. So I'm gonna zoom in here. And by the way, this is not to pick on IBM in any way, shape, or form. The data is the data, so it just is. Um, so for many applications, as I said, the circuit depth is square of the number of qubits. So if, we, if I draw a little box in the corner, you can see that for these benchmark applications is at about five qubits for their device, that if I squared that, so roughly 25 gates, is kind of where they are at a place before they hit a lot of red for these applications. So we'd say kind of roughly speaking, just very roughly, that they have five usable qubits for these applications. That's kind of good enough for them to be able to run that particular uh, things. And if they go beyond that, then suddenly you see lots of error, and now it doesn't work, okay? So we would, call, we would say they would have roughly five algorithmic qubits. And then if you look at I and Q, you would see, okay, there's not, an, there's not a lot of red. In fact, actually, there's none. And I can draw a box. And if, you know, at roughly 15, 16, you know, qubits, you're looking at, you know, 225 to 256 gates that you can do. And that seems to work for these, uh, for these applications. So it indicates that kind of where your applications can actually run successfully in that space. Again, we would say that this would be 15 or 16 algorithmic qubits. So here's kind of more of a formal definition of algorithmic qubits. Unfortunately, it's more complex than this. Um, you, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have very few qubits and you have great fidelity, then you need to do this kind of min calculation. And if you go the other way, you know, that limits you. There's lots of ways. And by the way, there's a whole series of other things that really matter decoherence times and all sorts of things that also matter. But just some, you know, from a sim simple point of view, how can you determine which of these machines are actually the best machines? By the way, INQ has got the best machines. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Okay, so just to kind of walk through this, because there's lots of discussion about all sorts of, of things. So if I have 100 qubits at a uh, gate fidelity of 95%, it says that the fidelity would allow me to do 11 gates, and I would have an algorithmic qubit number of three. Three usable qubits for most applications. Doesn't mean that you couldn't find an application that you could use more, but for average applications, you would only be able to use three of them. At 31 uh, qubits with 96, it really doesn't make a lot of difference, it turns out, because it turns out fidelity starts to matter at the tail end. So fewer qubits, higher fidelity, yeah, it doesn't really make much difference, still three. 127 qubits, these numbers were chosen randomly, by the way. 127 qubits with maybe a gate fidelity of 98.6, it says 40 gates, roughly six useful qubits for most applications. Now I'm gonna bump it up to 1,000 qubits. Wow, I should get a lot for that thousand qubits, but I'm being limited by the gate fidelity. So it's no better than the 127. 
It's identical. And then if you had 21 qubits with even higher fidelity, suddenly you can get to a lot more gates and a lot more algorithmic qubits. So now I haven't talked about error correction yet, but in these early days, these are the facts of how this actually works. And so when you're thinking about which system you want to use, you know, the question is, is, is you look at these things and you say, okay, well, in certain systems I can do more than I can do in others. I'll just talk a little bit about gate speeds for a second. It is true that gate speeds at some point are going to be very, very significant. But if you're trying to do 11 gates on your processor, it really doesn't matter. You know, you're not going to be, you're not going to be waiting and going and getting a cup of coffee if you're only doing 11 gates. That matters when you're going to do millions of gates or billions of gates. And you can see from here, that's kind of a long way off. So we think gate speed is an important issue, but it's not an important issue today. It will be an important issue into the future. So I'm going to just bring in some error correction and just show you that as well. So 160 qubits, uh, overhead of 16 to 1. We showed uh, a uh, error corrected qubit. You saw the, probably the paper in Nature, the first company to do it. Um, so I take the, the total number of qubits, I divide by the error correction overhead. That gives me 10 algorithmic qubits, uh, 10 qubits, and that buys me another nine. So I go from 99.9 .9 to 99.99. And from that, I can do roughly 5,200 uh, gates, which is great but I only have 10 qubits. So that kind of sucks. It's, I've managed to get a lot more gate fidelity, but I've reduced obviously the number of useful qubits. So here's the same thing, 160 qubits, no error correction, and I can get to the same 22. So if I had to choose between the two, I would not use error correction yet, even though I could, because I can get to more useful qubits for most average applications without error correction. If I had 1,024 qubits, same error correction overhead, again, I go from 99.9 to four nines, and now suddenly I can use 64 of those are good enough. And we think roughly at about 70 qubits, uh, algorithmic qubits, you can start to take on the cloud or the world's largest supercomputers. So this is kind of where INQ's actual short-term goal is, is to get to this kind of number. Now, INQ is at only 1,000 qubits to get pretty close to it, and the reason is is because our, our error correction overhead is so low. It's only 16 to 1. But you'll notice I only applied enough error correction to be able to get to the next step up so I could get to the next fidelity. I didn't try to go off and do 15 nines. Because if I tried to do the 59s, I would need a lot more uh, error correction overhead, which would reduce the total number of useful qubits. So I'm leaking in error correction as I need it, only as I need it, because we have this resource which is limited, which is the total number of physical qubits. And similarly, if I was to go through and just rely on native uh, gate fidelity, no error correction, 64 qubits with 99.98, no error correction, gets me to 51 algorithmic qubits. And lastly, um, I'll go through and, and uh, once again, no error correction. If I improve that, that gate fidelity from 99.98, just one more, 99.99, I go all the way from 51 to 72 useful algorithmic qubits. And I am there. I am ready to take on the world in both supercomputers and the cloud. So to that end, I'm going to announce today INQ's next generation quantum computer. This is our sixth generation machine. Uh, we've said before that uh, we are always working on three generations at one time. We're not building them sequentially. And each generation is obviously better than the, than the last. So today we're announcing that machine and it has a bunch of new advantages for you. So you can see here um, the two systems here, uh, there's two today which are sitting on the cloud. Those are the ones to the left. The latest generation um, is a system which is available to customers uh, via subscription today. 
And so, uh, but today what I'm going to be talking about is our next generation, and it's going to be using a different atomic species. It's using barium. And there's a bunch of important reasons that I want to, that we want to move into this particular space. By the way, there's these other computers uh, which are currently at various stages of completion. And so you'll hear future announcements about those as well. So why is barium important? Um, well, first one is the fundamental gate limit is pretty darn good. It's 99.98%. So it means that if we can get it down to that, you can get to a lot of useful qubits. So that's just one of the things we're really excited about barium. And, and we're getting there without error correction. It probably also means that we can use even less error correction in the future. The other one is that the, the spectrum of light that we're using here moves from ultraviolet to visible light. And that's really important, and I'll explain why. So in ultraviolet, um, lasers tend to burn optics. So if you look at our existing systems out on the cloud, every couple of months we have to take them down for maintenance and we replace some of the optics. So, so the question, and, and it's not a big deal, but now with, with uh, visible light, it doesn't do that. But here's the important thing in, with its relationship to gate speeds. Even though I said that gate speeds today don't matter, obviously it's something that we want to work on. Well, the gate speeds are a function of the laser power that you can apply to the qubits. If you can put more laser power, you can get the gates to be faster. So we wrote a paper about this, I don't know, about six months ago, that went through and explained the relationship between laser power and gate speeds. And the thing is with barium, is now we can increase the laser power, so it means that I can increase the gate speeds. So there's this wives' tale that you've probably all heard that says that uh, ion traps are slow. Well, this is, we, we had decided not to really work on this because it's not an issue right now, but we knew always how we could fix it. And this new machine is the beginning of that particular process. The other piece is now we move into a spectrum of light, which is common in telecom and data centers. And so now suddenly I can use things like fiber optic cables. I can get out of free space, which means my fidelity will go up. And it also means I can do things like silicon waveguides. So suddenly I can use a whole new range of technologies that allows me to shrink the hell out of the quantum computer because I can start to put the whole thing onto individual chips. Instead of seeing, probably you've seen images of, of uh, ion trap systems where it's this pegboard with lots of, of optics kind of put onto the pegboard. Well now moving into visible light allows me to compress all that. And, it, and since we're an optical computer, when you shrink it, it just gets better because what you're doing is you're removing some of the error out of the system. Um, and then the other thing which is really cool is we're already working on networking together quantum computers. And so uh, what this allows us is to network them over greater distances. So we're excited about that too. The other piece in this particular announcement is that we are changing our qubit addressing system. In the old generation, what, what, there, was, there was a laser. It went through basically a beam splitter. It created 32 beams. And there was one beam for every uh, ion, or every qubit. So the question would be, well, how do you get to millions of qubits? Does that mean you need to have millions of laser beams? And so the answer was never no. Uh, so this generation of system solves that problem. Um, what it has is a, a device that allows us to adjust the beam to be able to choose individual qubits. This also gets us to higher fidelity because in the previous generation, to be able to go through and um, align them, we had to align them mechanically, and it wasn't perfect. But now this is under software control, so we can align the beams directly to the qubits, and we can adjust that you know, during the day. So you can get to several hundred qubits from a single beam now. So we're no longer limited by the laser beams in terms of the total number of qubits. So we're excited about this as, as well. So we said to the market, there's a set of things that we need to be able to do to get to scale. And these are the set of things that we're working on. And with the barium announcement today, these sets of things become much easier. 
for our particular progress to get to scale. So I'm very excited about this system. We, uh, we look forward to working with you in the coming year so that you can get access to it as well. Um, I'm just gonna close my talk with talking about network effects and uh, really a call to action for the industry to kind of come together. So I don't know if you know network effects. This is in economics and there are several other fields. If I, have, uh, if I was a manufacturer of a telephone and I connect just two telephones together, the telephone's useful. You know, it's, it's kind of a cool thing, but it's kind of limited, obviously, because they can only call one other person. But if I expand that network to more, I didn't actually make a better telephone, but the telephone somehow, by adding users, got to a higher value. So I didn't make a better product, I just added users to it. And of course, this scales very nicely, that I see as a consumer, I see more and more value as I add more and more people. And we've seen this in the tech industry and many other things. Social is a prime example of that. Now, normally people talk about network effects within the context of, of users, but it also exists in terms of an eco, uh, ecosystem. So if you were to look at Android, you know, there was, a, there was a network effect that came together. There was a bunch of companies that got together and made Android happen. It wasn't just one company, it was many. And the sum of the parts were greater um, you know, in this particular case. What I don't see today in quantum is that for quantum. Instead, what we have is a number of companies that think that they're gonna build it all. And if you, I mean, it's pretty amazing. We are, here we are in Santa Clara and for in every direction, there's companies which are all part of a classical computing system. And there's so much to be done in quantum. Quantum networking, compilers, just the list goes on and on. So I think that it would be good for the industry if we actually figured out how we could work together. What matters not so much as to who's going to win this game, but that we get to a working quantum computer to solve the world's problem. And I care more about that than I do being to be able to say the person that actually says control the world. I think if we decided classically that Intel was going to be the company that was going to do it all, then it wouldn't have progressed as quickly as it had. So it took all the companies to be able to make that work. And we need to do that in quantum as well. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>